Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. On this nice yes. snowy last blast of winter, hopefully. <laughs> Oh, you want to say welcome to worship? Works out. Oh, I have a funny picture to show you, and so she said welcome to dog worship because of this We're picture. All dogs. We're all dogs. <laughs> the word. <laughs> oh, but look, it makes her so happy. Look, walk over there, show your smile. Walk over there, show your smile. <laughs> We all get to be dogs today. That's what the kids like to do. And that would be scandalous. That's the word of the day, scandalous. So the word of the day is scandalous because Jesus did a lot of scandalous things when he was on earth. And our Bible story today is one of those scandalous things. Welcome so, to dog worship. <laughs> welcome to dog worship. And then, oh, look at this one. This is my angry face when I feel you've been scandalous. <laughs> See, the religious leaders, when Jesus was scandalous, boy, that's how they looked. It looked like they were weaned on a pickle, right? I did. I did show the dog face. There's the dog face, and there's the cat face, and then here's the people face. Oh, please. Scandalous. We were going to wear hats today and see if you could tell the difference, but we forgot. Lord, as we come into your presence today, we are happy and joyful that we know you. We, won't, we give praise to you, Jesus, and we hail the power of Jesus' name. Lord, the angels fall before you, and we want to bring forth this royal crown and crown you, Lord of all. We ask that, uh, we want you, Lord Jesus, to be the Lord of our lives. And so that's why we're worshiping you today. Uh, to the world, that is a scandalous thought, but to you, it is your will. And so we want to please you today. All this, we pray in Jesus' name. Uh, accept this worship. Amen. Amen. So stand up if you are able. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail. Yeah. 
Lord this morning. Amen. Yes, amen. <laughs> Children, come down. Well, we're down to the two of you today. Tell you what. I tell you. Yeah. Well, we're glad you're here. And uh, I know Elijah's homesick, and I think, I think Reese is starting to feel sick, too. So you guys know what this is, don't you? Check one, two. Am I on? Am I on? Yes, I am. You know what this is? What is it? It's a plant. It's a clover. And this... This is how most of them appear. They have three leaves on them, and it's kind of cool because they almost like three hearts, right? So um, most of them grow with three leaves, but there is a thing called a four-leaf clover. Here's what a four-leaf clover looks like. What do you think of that? Thank you. Can I have that? No? Okay. <laughs> you just wanted to show me? Okay. Now, a four-leaf clover is very rare. They say that one in 10,000 of these, you'll get four-leaf clover. So you could look through 10,000 of these, 
and maybe find one four-leaf clover. Now, uh, some people think that you have to be... Yeah, well, let's count all of them. One, two... Yes, there are eight halves, yeah, because she's counting the, the, the two of the heart, yeah, yeah. But there's four leaves, see, you're missing the point. So. <laughs> there you go, cut it in half, she says. Focus, yeah, focus, weed hopper. Okay, so uh, what was I trying to say? Oh, so some people think that, that it's lucky to find a four-leaf clover. And do you believe in luck? Do you guys know what luck is? You kind of believe in luck? I don't know. Yeah, do. You do? Yeah. Like if you walked out right now, and so it would be a miracle if you found a four-leaf clover in the snow right now, but let's say a couple months from now you went out there and you found a four-leaf clover. You'd, you might think, oh, I'm lucky. And you might think, I've got the luck of the Irish. Because yeah. Irish, they're, it, it was your birthday and you didn't even know. Yeah. Okay, so... We've had a lot of birthdays lately. So, um, uh, but you know what? I don't believe in luck. Do you know why I don't believe in luck? Because if you believe in luck, you might start to trust in luck. Like, ooh, I'm lucky, so I could go do this, or I could go do that, or I should, I should go to the casino of all places if I'm feeling lucky. No, there's no such thing as luck. Um, we're not supposed to trust in anything except God. God says, trust in the Lord. His word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. All four of them, right? Are you, how many hearts have you got? Um, ten hundred. She's got ten hundred hearts. How many hundred hearts do you have? Ten. She says, I've, got, I've just got ten hearts. Yeah, but it's because you guys have a lot of love. See, that's a good thing. Okay, so just remember to trust in the Lord, not in luck, right? Sound good? Okay. I'm going to set that down. Let's pray. Lord... We uh, trust in you because we love you, Lord. And we pray that uh, uh, you would make our path straight whenever we trust in you. That it wouldn't be luck, that it would be you. And because we trust in you, that uh, you ordain our steps. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen? Okay, you can head out. Yes. Hmm? We are blessed, not lucky. And we're about to be blessed by Karen Carell, who's going to come up and sing. She's going to th sing a uh, sort of a special music for us. You... You'll see. You'll see how it goes. Oh, I'm sure you'll be just fine. Oh, I'm sure. It's been a long time. It's been a while since we've, <laughs> since we've had you, so we're glad. It's been sure. over two years, so it's been a long time for me oh, not to boy. sing. I thought I had this down far enough. But... Oh, yes. <laughs> Look at my tonsils, though. I always have to tease her a little bit. <coughs> She's back then there came somewhere. the morning. <coughs> they all walked away with nothing to say. They had just lost their dearest friend. All that he said, now he was dead. So this is the way it would end. The dreams that they dreamed <coughs> were not what they seemed. Now that he was dead and gone, the jail, the hammer,
letting the water, the wine. Now it was done, they'd taken her son, wasted before his time. To do what was true, she watched him die too. scandalous. If you want to turn in your, uh, whoops, what am I doing here? There we go. Turn in your uh, Bibles to John chapter 5, because Jesus did many scandalous things. Uh, he shocked the sense of the religious, and he challenged the status quo quite often, didn't he? In our text today, Jesus intentionally stepped into a scandal. You know, he didn't do anything by accident. He, he stepped into a scandal, for sure. Uh, so it's in John chapter 5, right at the very beginning. And Jesus went to this pool uh, called the Pool of Bethesda. So Jesus had returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days, and inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the Pool of Bethesda. And it had five covered porches. Now, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, they lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. Now, when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Kind of an odd question. Of course he wanted to get well. Why would he be there if he didn't want to get well? So Jesus is trying to draw the man out. Do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? Well, I can't, sir, said the sick man. He said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Somebody else always gets there ahead of me. But Jesus told him, stand up, take your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat, and he began walking. Now, this miracle happened on the Sabbath. There's your scandal. It happened on the Sabbath, and the law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat, said the religious leaders. The Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who had been cured, hey, you can't work on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to carry your mat. 
What do you think you're doing? Well, he replied, uh, the man who, who healed me, he, he told me to pick up my mat and, and walk. Uh, well, who said such a thing as that, they demanded. Well, the man didn't know. Hadn't even bothered to get Jesus' name. Just started carrying his mat. Probably took off before even saying thank you. And you see, Jesus had disappeared into the crowd, so the man couldn't point him out. Uh, but afterward, Jesus found the same man in the temple, and he told him, Now you are well. Stop sinning, or something else worse may happen to you. Then the man went, and he told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that challenges us. Uh, there's a couple things in this, in this passage that give us pause, and, and we wonder uh, why, Jesus, you said what you did and, and how things worked out the way they did. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes and open our hearts, Lord. Many of us have heard this miracle and heard this story many times, but uh, there are some uh, wonderful golden nuggets to be mined here, and we want to find them. So open our eyes, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so Jesus solves a man's situation. The situation, 38 years. He's been coming to this pool, hoping to get in the water when the water is stirred. Legend had it that if, when an angel stirs up the water, if you're the first one to get in there, you get healed. Well, but his situation was he didn't have anybody to help him get in the water. Yeah, okay. I thought that was kind of weird because I thought, how did he get there? He must have had help to get there. Unless he was living there, and even if he was living at the pool, he'd have to have food brought to him by somebody who helped him. You know, it's like, why can't he? all those years and he couldn't find somebody to help him get in the water? Something just doesn't sit right there. And then, and then of course, Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? And, you know, the guy could have said, you think? Uh, why do you think I'm here? But no, he uses that excuse that he has nobody to help him. So when Jesus says that, the sick man stands up. Um, doesn't bother to find out who Jesus is. Apparently doesn't thank him. Um, perhaps he was just so excited he just left. Probably sick of looking at that water. Maybe he just picked up his mat and took off before he knew it. These Pharisees, these religious rulers, uh, they come after him because he's carrying his mat on the Sabbath, which you're not allowed to do. To them, the broken rules were more important than the man's healing. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? They should have been happy that he was healed. I'm sure they recognized him. Is that, are you the lame guy? Is that why you're carrying your mat? But no, they were like, hey, you can't do that. What do you think you're doing? And then Jesus says to the man, go and sin no more. Uh, the healed man betrays Jesus. He, he betrayed him. It's almost like uh, he, he, went, he was a tattletale, kind of, wasn't he? It's like, ooh, I have to go back to those Jewish leaders and tell them who it was, because they asked me. So now I know who it is, I'm going to go tell them who it was. Um, I don't think he was doing it out of the goodness of a heart. <laughs> I think he was doing it because he, he didn't want to be in trouble. He, he wanted that, he, if anybody was going to get in trouble for this, it should be Jesus, according to this healed man. So, so anyway, so why did he ask if he wanted healing? Um, you see, the, the man's problem had become a way of life. With no help, he had little hope. He had little hope of being healed. His problem ran deeper than his legs. In addition to the paralysis, the man suffered from self-pity. He was envious of others who got into the water before him. And... Uh, while nobody was there to help him into the water, you know, he must have had some kind of help to come and go. So self-pity is a very addictive thing, isn't it? When we start feeling sorry for ourselves. Um, I catch myself once in a while feeling sorry for myself, and uh, I usually try to stop and ask myself, why, well, okay, I'm feeling sorry for myself, why? Why am I? Why am I having a pity party? What's, what's going on? Why do I think I deserve this uh, pity party? And, uh, and then as I pray about it and think about it, usually I will realize that I really don't have a good reason to. 
where I'm not counting my blessings or I'm just focusing on my problem, you know, my situation, uh, my circumstances. Our problems get bigger when we focus on them. But God is bigger when we focus on him. And we need to speak to our problems that they aren't so big, but our, problem, uh, but our God is bigger than our problems. One of my mentors, a good friend of mine, Pastor Burton Kincaid, when he prays, he almost always includes this verse. Lord, we know you're bigger than what's the matter. You're bigger than anything's the matter. And so that stuck with my head to remind, to remind me how big our God is. That he's bigger than whatever's the matter. Well, uh, Jesus knows and Jesus cares. He cares about what you need. And so the question is, will you let Christ minister to your deepest needs? Because your deeper needs, the deepest needs go deeper usually than our physical problems or our economic problems or the price of gas and all that. Usually our deepest need is uh, something inside of us, some kind of soul problem. You know, maybe we're not trusting in the Lord like we should. We're we're starting to feel sorry for ourselves because we're unlucky. Well, this bad thing happened and then that bad thing happened and I guess I'm just an unlucky person and we're not trusting in the Lord when we feel that way. Um, and our feelings mislead us into thinking that we're just an unlucky person. Uh, but what we have found as believers in Christ is we no longer go from problem to problem. We go from victory to victory. You know, have you noticed that as you've walked with the Lord over the years, you actually end up going from victory to victory. So when you face a problem, you start thinking, oh, I can't wait to see, Lord, what you're going to do with this. You're going to do something great here. What's it going to be? I can't wait to see what it is. Um, and that encourages you to give God some time to work things out. Um, you know, if we just jump in there and try to fix things, we go too fast, we might get ahead of God. But you have to ask yourself, do you want to get well? Do you really want to get well? And usually the answer is, well, sure I do. Um, well, if you're, if you're sure you do, have you really let God uh, come into your heart enough to expose to you your deepest needs? One of the genius things about the 12-step programs like AA and NA is they get people to get their eyes off the problem, that the alcohol or the drugs is really just a symptom of their problem. And if you go through the 12 steps, eventually you will discover that, that there really there's something broken inside that makes me want to depend on some substance or some other outside thing to make me feel better or to let me escape or to numb the pain. You know, some of us self-medicate so that we uh, don't feel the pain that, that life can bring us. Um, well, uh, sometimes, it, you know, basically we're all broken, aren't we? We come to Jesus with wounds, um, and sometimes when those wounds show up, well, we need to face them and see if the Lord can fix them, because he wants to fix them, but he wants us to understand what's broken inside so that he can help us to be healed. And um, there are crowds, that, here you have this pool, <laughs> It says there's five porches, and it said that there were crowds of sick people around the pool. And it always just occurs to me, you know, Jesus did a lot of things for individuals. Whenever somebody needed help, if they came to him, he would give them help. And sometimes, like this one, he would pick someone out of the crowd and help them. But, you know, you might have wondered, and maybe I'm alone in this, but I've always wondered... Why didn't he just heal everybody? <laughs> all right, you're all healed. Stop believing in the stupid angel in the water. You know, it really is. It's God's who healing you anyway. And I'll prove it to you. It's not the water. It's not the angel stirring the water. If you just trust in God, he'll heal you. And boom, here you go. You're all healed. Now, stand up and go home. You know, hanging out here, doing nothing. Why don't you go? To, go. Let's all go as a crowd to show the priests how God has healed you. You know? But I think... I think Jesus would have, he would have blown up in his popularity just too fast if he had done that. And so it's his, a part of his plan was to minister to individuals and then have that be a witness to others. And then would they believe 
without seeing it in their own lives. At least they saw it in someone else's life where they would take someone else's word for it, but would they believe without seeing the sign or the miracle? So he had a lot of reasons for not healing everybody. Um, but it reminds us to put our faith in the healer, not the process. Uh, all right, put your faith in the healer above all else. It's a good way to say that, I suppose. Now, the miracle introduces the Jesus scandal. Now, the Jesus scandal uh, goes beyond him telling, telling the man to break the rules and stand up and carry your mat. And it even goes beyond the fact that he did it on the Sabbath. Well, we need to take a look at this. Was this work he was telling the man to do? And if you are to keep the Sabbath, and Jesus knew it was the Sabbath, why would he, why would he risk causing a scandal? Well, he must have had a, a reason to risk the scandal. He wanted to point out to them that they had their brains in the wrong place, that they were worried too much about their rules. Now, if you look at some of these passages, I've, I've listed them in your program. Um, Jeremiah 17, 21 says, this is what the Lord says. Listen to my warning. Stop carrying on your trade at Jerusalem gates on the Sabbath day. So stop doing commerce for your business. Stop doing your business on the Sabbath day. That's Jeremiah 17, 21. And uh, here is Nehemiah 13, 15. So you remember Jeremiah was before the exile when he said that. Nehemiah is after the exile when they've been restored. And so they've been, they had been 70 years in Babylon. Now they're back in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah is helping them rebuild the wall. And he says, um, he says, in those days I saw men of Judah treading out their wine presses on the Sabbath. He's talking about like before the exile. You know, I saw, I saw this going down. It was a bad, bad thing. They were also bringing in grain, loading it on donkeys, bringing their wine, grapes, figs, and all sorts of produce to Jerusalem to sell on the Sabbath. So I rebuked them for selling their produce on that day. Oh, this was happening when, during Nehemiah's time in Jerusalem. He started to see the people making the same mistakes, that they were doing business. Uh, they were doing their regular work on the Sabbath day. It's kind of like when we think, well, I need to work seven days a week. You know, I just, I can't afford not to. Well, sometimes employers make us do that. But a lot of times, if we will just take a stand and just say, well, I, I, I don't, you know, work on the Lord's day. For me, the, the, the Lord's day is, is a Sunday and, I, and I, I worship God. I'm more about, I'm not about making a living one day a week. I'll, I'll do six days a week. Any hours as you want, but that one day of the week, I'm not going to do it. I wish more people would take that stand, and that could be a risky thing. It could be, dare I say it, scandalous if you did that. Oh, we have one guy that doesn't work on a Sunday. Well, I tell you, um, you know, look at the financials of uh, Chick-fil-A. Their stores are not open on Sundays, even when they're in a mall, and the mall requires stores to be open every day of the week, they won't do it on Sunday. And uh, for two reasons, one is the main guy says uh, that he uh, doesn't, he wants his workers to have one day a week off. He's thinking about his workers and then he doesn't want to do commerce himself on that day. So I, I hope he's stuck to that. Uh, but it, they said that you couldn't, you couldn't follow that model today, that you, you wouldn't be successful. And yet Chick-fil-A's are continue to pop up all over uh, the nation, and we're getting, we're actually seeing some in Michigan now, and that's kind of cool, I think. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so Chick-fil-A is a little scandalous for a couple of reasons, right? Uh, because they, they stand for God's truth. When you take a stand for God's truth, it causes a scandal. Uh, but see, Jesus is trying to let them know God's working all the time. He doesn't take off his work on the Sabbath, on the Lord's Day. He doesn't take off. He continues to do his thing, to keep working, to working in the lives of people and to bring about, um, to bring about uh, his plan, you know, to grow the kingdom of God. He's going to do whatever it takes to do that. On, uh, and, and if that requires doing his work on Sunday, great, he will do that. 
Now, of course, uh, I need to address probably the fact that the Sabbath day was the seventh day of the week. And Christians, Gentile Christians, started worshiping on the first day of the week. So you need to know a couple things if you haven't heard this before. I'll give you the quick rundown. First of all, we worship on Sunday, and we call that the Lord's Day. Technically, it's not the Sabbath, but it is our one day a week to give our attention to the Lord. Why do we do that? Because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And so it's, it's, every Sunday is Resurrection Day, and we're celebrating his resurrection that Jesus you know, is alive. Now, the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, you would say, well, okay, Saturday, Saturday, that's in. But let me ask you, when does Saturday start? In our culture, Saturday starts at midnight, late Friday night, and it goes till the next midnight, right? Because that's how we track time. That's not how they track time. Sabbath began at sundown on Friday. So the, the, the sixth day of the week ends at sundown. And then it goes, then the Sabbath continues to the next sundown. So it's the time was always was always changing. So we kind of need to we kind of need to keep that in mind. Um, and uh, so there there's there's probably more you know reasons and other things that I could go into on that. I don't want to make a whole sermon about that, but uh, but I do believe that we are doing the right thing and that our uh, Sunday. We call it uh, the Lord's Day. Um, we are not bound by, by the law, although it's tricky, isn't it? Because it's one of the Ten Commandments, to keep the Sabbath day holy. What does that mean? Set it aside from your normal work. So at least take one day a week to stop your normal work. So I've often said, um, you know, I've, even as an engineer and then again as a pastor, I pretty much have a desk job. You know, unless I'm working on the parsonage or something, it's not a physical job. So for me to do something physical on Sunday, it doesn't feel like work to me at all. You know, I, back in Kentucky, I would mow the lawn on Sunday, and it didn't bother me at all. I'm, I'm doing physical labor, but I'm not a physical laborer, so I wasn't, you know what I'm saying? I, I kind of felt like that was the case. So um, remember, uh, remember that, and let's try not to do our regular type of work on Sunday. Let's leave it uh, to the Lord. Because Jesus was not breaking the law. They claimed he was. He was only um, breaking their rules that they said was based on the law. And their rules were, were crazy. So it's also another thing that reminds us that, you know, um, God's law takes precedence. What God, God's will takes precedence over man's rules and regulations. Just because something is legal doesn't make it right, correct? Okay, now we need to look, um, I just got a text, oh, isn't that nice? My prescription's ready, it'll appear. <laughs> how, wonder, how wonderful, it's a good thing I brought my phone up here, now I can adjust and, and get back to, uh, yeah, let's see, there we go, okay. Ah, such fun, it would be scandalous. Should I go get my stuff? I, should I go do commerce on Sunday? I think I'll, I don't think I'll go down there today. I'll wait. But apparently they're doing business on Sunday because they just told me. <laughs> <clears throat> Need your drugs. Come and get them. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you about Jesus' scandal of the Christ. See, the Jesus scandal, the title of my message is The Jesus Scandal. What's the Jesus scandal? The, the, the ultimate Jesus scandal is his death upon a cross. Why? And why is it that so many Jews have a hard time accepting Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah? Well, it's because he was crucified. They can't accept that uh, a man would be crucified because if you were, that the Messiah couldn't be crucified because if you were, that you were cursed of God. It says right here in the word of God, um, we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block. Scandalon means literally an offense to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. So 1 Corinthians 1, 123 is where we get the word scandal from. And the English translates it a stumbling block. 
So before I get to the curse, we need to talk about that. Scandal, and I have on the screen and on your programs, the word scandalon, that is the Greek word for an offense, a scandalous offense, okay? It, so it's where we get the word scandal from, is the Greek word scandalon. So the scandalon with a capital S is the death of Christ on the cross. That is the Jesus scandal. And um, uh, it's a stumbling block. It's a scandal to the Jews. We'll see in Scripture in a moment why. And it's folly to the Gentiles. Why, why would somebody willingly go to death, uh, that kind of a gruesome death? You know, it just seems foolish or a folly to, to those who uh, are not Jewish. Now, so Jews cannot accept the Messiah who has been cursed by God. The word of God says, anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. That's Deuteronomy 21, 23. Yeah. He wasn't cursed for his iniquity. He was cursed for our iniquity. And if you read Isaiah 53, you find out in the chapter 53 of Isaiah, Isaiah is describing the suffering servant of God. And that's what they couldn't reconcile. They couldn't reconcile that the Messiah would be serving God by suffering on our behalf. So he broke the curse by suffering on our behalf because he didn't deserve the curse. But he took the curse upon himself. He took our curse. He took your curse upon himself. And that's the very idea of a suffering servant. Uh, one who would suffer for somebody else. Would lay down his life for, for another. Um, and then to others, it seems foolish that one man should die a horrible death to pay for the sins of others. And so my question for you is, does, does the cross offend you? Now, you all here would probably say, no, I, I understand why he had to die for me. Um, some human beings over over time have had a hard time accepting the fact that somebody else had to die. You know, it could be hard for me to accept that someone else had to die for my mistakes, for my choices, that I chose to live my life according to what I wanted to do and I ignored God and I was, a little, I was gonna be the Lord of my life and because I made those choices, Jesus had to die on the cross. You know, that, that's an offense to my pride, you know, that I couldn't be good enough to get into heaven on my own. Well, I've never killed anybody. Well, man, I've mean, told a lie. Yeah, I've told lies, so I guess that makes me a liar. And have ever stolen anything? Yeah. yeah, I guess I have stolen. So that makes me a thief. So by my own admission, I'm a liar and I'm a thief. And have oh, have I ever lusted after somebody who wasn't my wife? Well, you know, I'm a I'm a human male, so yeah, I can't say I never did that. Uh, so mm, boy, so yeah, so according to Jesus, that makes me like virtually an adulterer, if not literally. Uh, so, you know, I'm already, and I've always kept God number one in my life, or if I put other things ahead of God, well, yeah, I've blown the first commandment. Um, have I let anything else be an idol in my life where I thought I needed that more than I needed God? Well, yeah. So I guess I've been an idol worshiper too. So I'm already up to five of the ten, or six of the ten commandments, just by being honest. So, yeah. It's... It, it, it's the, that message can be offensive to some because they don't want to admit that they have sinned against God. None of us want to admit it, but once we do admit it, then we can, we, we can have the solution. The good news is we don't have to pay for our sins because he already did. That's the good news. I don't have to continue penance for anything. Uh, Jesus paid the ultimate price, so you, know, you are bought with a price, uh, the life the death and life of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you don't, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to do penance. You don't have to take, oh, well, I made that mistake, so now I, you know. Certainly, we live with the consequences of our choices, don't we? So bad things may happen because I made an immoral choice, and I may have to live with that, concept, that uh, uh, consequence. I may have to live with that consequence, but that doesn't mean I'm doing penance for my sin. It's just the consequence of a bad choice I made or a dumb choice or a, or a sinful choice I made. So 
Anyway, but I think this passage is really good as far as helping us understand that, you know, that, that Jesus' plans often go way beyond what we see on the surface. It was way more to this than just a man standing up after 38 years of not walking and picking up his mat and walking. There's way more going on here than just that. Um, so let's, let's take a moment to pray for uh, the deeper meanings and the deeper needs that we have in our lives. Lord, as we come to you, uh, we think of our, you know, we think of this man um, feeling sorry for himself and, and worrying and wondering and uh, just stuck in his situation. Uh, the circumstances, Lord, uh, I know I've been stuck many times in my own circumstances. And, and so, Lord, they, they get bigger the more we focus on them. So, Lord, help us not to do that. Help us to trust in you. We don't want to trust in circumstances, whether they're good or bad, lucky or unlucky, according to the world. We trust in you. And we acknowledge you. And because we acknowledge you, because we submit to you, uh, we know that you will make our paths straight. And we thank you that you do that in our lives. Many of us can look back and see answered prayers, even recently, of how you have brought, you've, you've, made, you've opened a path, you opened a door, you've made a way for us um, uh, to, to uh, do what we felt you wanted us to do. And how cool is it that we see that? Um, and how many times is it, have you done that and we haven't been aware? Thank you for making us more aware of the fact that you are doing this kind of work and to help us to give you honor and glory in everything we do, not just on your day, Sunday, but the first day of the week, but all days of the week, that we might, we, we want to commit to you, Lord, that we want to, everything we do to be an act of worship unto you. Um, that's our desire. Now help us to live up to that desire every day, that all that we do or say, act upon or even think, that it would be to your glory and not to ours because you are the Lord, you are God, and we are not. Thank you for being our God, and we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, let's have the worship team come up. We have a, a song that I want to share with you. Oh, there's the cursed that was hangs on a tree. There's a song that uh, we've been learning as a, a worship team. It's called Glorious Day. And it's just a wonderful song for Easter time. So we are going to share that with you. And uh, it'll sort of be one of our songs for, for this time of year for Lent as we approach. As we approach uh, Good Friday. So. Now the key phrase, you know, modern songs, they have to have a hook. Okay? So like the, the thing that really sticks in your head. Well, the hook to this song is, you know, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. That's okay, sweetheart. It'll, it'll keep recording. So just, just when we get to, and, and uh, you can hear it when you, when you hear this on the radio, you know, they, they I ran out of that grave. It's kind of like a, almost a, a shout of victory. It's a, it's a shout to me kind of a thing, isn't it? So. Uh, if you know the song, sing along. If not, just uh, let it uh, sort of wash over you. But let's, uh, let's stand together, uh, if you're able, uh, to worship the Lord. I was buried.
front to uh, some like to come and kneel and uh, if you have any prayer requests I think uh, Larry's got them for us so if you would uh, be so kind as to hand those to me thank you very much oh yes oh, Peggy can I put you on the spot and ask you how's Jim doing today Okay. He, he, um, he had really weak on dialysis day. It was a double whammy yesterday, so he didn't have a really good night. But that's okay. what he's there for is to get his friends. I just hope they take care of him. And can, can he have visitors there? Do you know? Yeah, they said he can. And he can have visitors. From 10 to 5, if you want to go visit Jim Don. Yeah. So if, if you don't recall or if you haven't heard yet, he had uh, yet another operation. <laughs> Uh, on his uh, foot, he, his, the second time he's had to have half a foot removed. So now he's got half feet on both feet. So the toes had to be taken off because they just would not heal. Uh, so, uh, uh, but he's, he seems to be doing very well because of that. Uh, and and there, there's an answer to prayer that you were able to make it back to, to Michigan where Getting home in that condition was it was tricky. Lord is with you, and he made a way for you to get back here. And the doctors here said, no, we don't need to amputate his leg. We, we think we could just take off the front of his foot, and he'll, he'll heal up. So a second opinion and a second state worked out very well. So we want to um, remember him and keep him in our prayers. And, of course, we've got uh, Soon here to pray for and Don Wyman. And, uh, yeah. and I love this comment. This, this world is a mess, but God is good. Well, Lord, we come to your presence. We do thank you. Thank you, God, you hear our prayers. Together, we want to come to you with some prayers, some um, joys and concerns, Lord. We are, we are joyful that Jim, Jimmy Dunn is feeling better, that, is, that, that that infection has been removed from his body. We pray that his foot would heal and that his other foot would heal up as well in his heel so that he would be able to stand and walk um, and Lord, you know his legs are weak from all this hospital stay and, and uh, the pain in his, in his feet. So God, just give him strength in his legs. We're asking you to strengthen him. Uh, that the rehab he gets at Stonegate, that it would have like almost miraculous results as he quickly becomes stronger. And God, we lift up Christine to you, the cousin of Leanne and Joellen. Uh, she is starting intensive treatment for cancer and um, Lord, so for, for Christine, we pray, Lord, we ask that you would deliver her from this cancer. I pray that whatever treatment she gets, that it would be exactly what she needs to knock that cancer right out of her body. And we'll give you the praise for that. You are the one who brings healing. So guide these doctors and this, uh, use this medicine, Lord. Or you, Lord, you can just knock that right out of her. Uh, and so we just pray that... It, According to your will that you would heal her of the cancer, Lord. Um, we do have a joy and a praise that Dawn Wyman had her stint put in uh, successfully. And so thank you, Lord, for answered prayer as, as we've been praying for Dawn Long Wyman. Uh, bless her, Lord, and heal her and help her heart to be strong, Lord, and help her blood flow to, to be as you would have it. And we know, Lord, that you are still with Soon and Willard and that soon continues to battle her way out of uh, this ventilator. Um, and uh, they're trying, Lord, to, to keep her sedated enough so she doesn't hurt herself, but then she needs to come out of the sedation in order to get that um, ventilator turned off. So, Lord, just we're asking that you would bring her out of it. Bring her out of it, raise her up, make her whole, and, and it'll be to your glory because, you know, she shouldn't have lasted this long. Uh, with such a drastic effect of COVID on her body, Lord. But uh, you've kept her alive, um, and all healing is from you. So just heal her. We are asking that you would heal her in your will, in your way. 
um, deliver her from, from that virus and the effects of it. And uh, be with our brother Willard, uh, Pastor Willard, Lord, just bless him. Bless him. Uh, continue to give him faith and courage to, to trust you for this positive outcome that we're seeing. Um, it seems to be a very slow process, but in your time, it's happening. So we're thankful that you are bringing healing in your time. Um, and Lord, this world is a mess. Uh, there are things, there are wars and rumors of wars, just as you warned us. Um, but you are good all the time. We know that your goodness uh, is never changing. And it seems like the evil of the world just keeps getting worse and worse. Um, Lord, people that turn their back on you. So, Lord, we're praying that you would open the eyes of those who have been deceived, help them to see the truth of life in Christ, help them to see the truth of their actions, uh, you know, help this world leader to realize that your will is not communism, your will is not socialism, your will is not the Soviet Union or the uh, a Communist Party of any shape or form, but your will is freedom for humanity. And not just political freedom and freedom in this life, but freedom from sin. Because when you set us free, we are indeed free. And so, Lord, whether we're free or we're being, even if we are being persecuted for your name's sake, you have set us free from ourselves. And so for that, we're grateful. And so we're, we're just praying, Lord, the rest of the world would find the freedom that you've given us. Uh, we pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Woo! I always appreciate our prayer time together. It feels good, doesn't it? You just spend some time with prayer in the Lord. Our Tuesday night prayer group was going strong, and um, uh, it's, it's fun to do that online. Sometimes it's a challenge because two people start talking at once, and, and uh, it just happens. But we deal with it, and then somebody continues and the next person jumps in so it works out just fine and so if you'd like to be a part of that let me know and we'll connect you up with that um, thank you for coming uh, down to your organ it's nice having you back Peggy yes. to play a little bit with it um, we are going to do the doxology so if you want to get ready for that uh, so but our offering will be in the boxes again as usual I appreciate uh, how our Budget is being met for this year already, and that is wonderful. So keep up the good work of giving as an act of worship. Um, we do have a new communication tool, and it's called uh, Call Multiplier. So there's a sheet going around. I wonder if I brought one with me up here. Uh, it's kind of salmon colored. And uh, last week, a number of you filled one out. If you haven't filled one out yet, please read it and then fill that out. If you would like to be on our uh, Pleasant View automatic calling system. I can record a message, or Elizabeth or Leanne perhaps, or Jesse could record a message, and then it would be sent out to every phone that's on there. It would be called, and you would hear the recorded message. And we'll identify it as a recorded message. It won't be any kind of solicitation. They don't sell phone numbers or anything like that. You also have the option of getting a text. Um, and some can receive text and some can't. Some can receive voice messages and some can't. So uh, I, guess, I guess we'll have to kind of do both to cover everybody. So you, you may get a voicemail and a text, uh, but uh, we'll have you covered either way. And we're doing that because when something happens in the church family that we want everybody to know about, uh, we don't want anybody or anything to fall through the cracks. And so that happens in every church, but the bigger we get, the harder it is going to be to make sure everybody gets a call or gets a notice or gets that prayer request. So, so I'm asking that uh, everybody will participate in that, and if you have concerns or questions, let me know. I've already got 29 different people entered in there. Uh, some couples want each phone number in there, and that's fine. Some couples just wanted one of the two to get the message, and, and that's whatever you prefer as, as a couple to do. Um, and then what else do I have? Oh, yeah, our small groups, 7 o'clock Tuesday, Wednesday, Bible at noon. Bible studies at noon on Wednesdays now, and that's going well. Uh, four of us, we're going through the book of Genesis. And then the worship team is that night, and then the adults class. Remember, 945 here at the church, and uh, Larry is teaching that in the office over there. Yes?
Yes. Right. It's, it's been a it's been a long time. It's been a, like since before COVID that Carmen Kinney fell and hurt and broke so many bones and and uh, she was she's been at um, Sun. We call it Suncrest. It's the the county medical facility uh, Suncrest. Um, and so she's been there for for quite a while. So uh, but she can receive visitors now. Yay! So all you have to do is call her daughter Debbie and the phone numbers on. The bulletin board out there, is that right? And uh, right by the door, you'll see the phone number there for Carmen, if you know Carmen. She would love to get visitors. She'd love to. She loves peanut butter cookies, too. Oh, peanut butter cookies. There you go. Yeah. So you bakers. Yeah. I knew there was something I liked about her. Yes. She's a, fa a fan of peanut butter like I am. All right. Yes, Leanne has an announcement. I'm going to repeat that for those who are watching online uh, because they probably didn't hear you, Leanne, but Leanne's suggesting that we um, start getting, um, bringing in and collecting gift cards to give to Willard uh, and soon so that they can have, you know, help with uh, all the travel and the gas and the food and the various items. So if you have a gift card you'd like to donate or if you can get your hands on a gas card or uh, just think about that as the Lord puts it on your heart and then bring them in. Um, we'll, I guess we'll have to make a little box or something to, to put them in, and uh, we'll go from there. So, sound good? Let's, let's, let's shower them with gift cards. That sounds great. So, yeah. All right. Are you ready to sing the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him upon the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. Yeah.